me on the job. But they kind of fit in with what I'm going to talk about, and that is that sometimes it almost seems ridiculous, some of the people that God chooses to move things along. It seems like nearly every character that we have encountered in our narrative journey so far has managed to pull some pretty questionable stunts. Abraham passed Sarah off as his sister to save his own skin. Isaac does the same thing with his wife, Rebecca. Lot offered up his daughters to be raped in order to protect two guests in his home. Jacob stole his birthright from his sow. Joseph was a tattletale. Moses was a murderer, and now we meet David, the shepherd boy, whose exploits rival those of Genghis Khan. Yet, these, these are the righteous ones. These are the ones that God calls to advance the cause. Oddly enough, though, you know, I find comfort in that. I find comfort in knowing that those called to serve are just regular people minding their own business, full of flaws, but maybe filled with yearning for something more, something bigger, something greater than themselves. I find comfort in knowing that one doesn't have to be special, polished, well-bred, or perfect to be called by God. And I find it especially comforting that the Bible doesn't attempt to sugarcoat or cover up the flaws of our biblical characters. When we write our own history, we have this tendency to gloss over the imperfections and the misdeeds. We accentuate the good, we omit the bad, and we leave most people feeling inadequate and inferior. But the Bible, boy, the Bible puts it all out there. The good, the bad, the ugly, and while some people might find that disturbing, for me, it spells inclusion and it spells hope. Usually, in my sermons, I try to avoid talking a whole lot about myself, but, you know, I had a revelation the other day. I had a revelation that it is in the story of my own life and in the unfolding of my own life that that's where God speaks to me. And if I'm to pass that on to you, then I have to talk to you through my own story. So part of my story is that it took me a really long time to get comfortable with my call to ministry. In fact, I struggled with it all through seminary. Because while I knew for sure that I was being called, I didn't understand what God could possibly want with someone like me. Someone who had not been to church for a number of years. Someone who did not even identify as a Christian for a number of years. Someone who really did not know a whole lot about what went on in a church anymore. And someone who was most definitely full of flaws. But then one day I ran into a woman who was a retired minister. And she told me something I'll never forget. She said... God does not call the prepared. God prepares the call. Things started to change after that. I started to change after that. Not all at once, but enough that I could finally see that this was not my ship to steer. Up to that point, I thought I had a ton of work to do before I could be considered worthy of my call. But that is not how this thing works. So I can identify with these biblical misfits. Even David, not so much because he was a murderer and an adulterer, but because I know what it is to be really confused about priorities and who it is that's really in charge. David was called when he was still a young boy and in today's reading, he's made it all the way to the throne, and he's looking forward to settling down. By the age of 30, he has moved from shepherd to king, with a whole lot of bloodshed in between. But he's made it. He's climbed that royal ladder right 
straight to the top. David was your classic golden boy. He was a warrior, a king, a composer, a conqueror, a unifier, an organizer, and a man after God's own heart. A few chapters later, David will mess up big time, but today he's just tired, and he just wants some permanence and stability. Well, that's not hard to understand. We all reach that place where we just want to settle down into who we are, into caring and loving relationships, in caring and loving communities. Oftentimes, though, the pendulum swings too far the other way, and one day we realize that not only have we settled down, but somewhere along the way we started to cling to things. We started clinging to our little pieces of land, our little houses, our little relationships, our little bits of self-understanding and our little bits of understanding about God. We hold on for dear life and we forget. We forget that there's a whole landscape of wild and free holiness that we have barely even scratched the surface of. So David, He's ready to settle down, and he's decided that he wants to build God a house, a magnificent edifice to show the entire world how wonderful God is and what God has done. So he goes and he talks to his pastor, Nathan, and Nathan says, sure thing, let's start right away with those building plans. Trouble is, neither David nor Nathan stopped to consider how God might feel about it. Well, God didn't think too much of it, that's for sure. He says to Nathan, I have not ever lived in a house. Did I even say that I wanted a house? I've been roaming about with you all along, taking care of you. I'm on the move. I'm on the move in you. You can't settle me down. A few years back, while I was still in seminary, I went on a trip to the Holy Land. And I believed, I truly believed that if I could just stand in the Garden of Gethsemane or at the entrance to the tomb or at the baptismal site of Jesus or any site in the Holy Land, that I would finally encounter God. So I would stand in one holy place after another, just waiting for the magic to sweep over me. And then sure enough, the tour guide would ruin everything by saying that no one was really sure that this was the actual site, but it was a good approximation. <laughs> that was frustrating. But you know what? After enough of this, I eventually came to realize that it didn't matter where I was because everywhere was a holy place. Just being in the holy land meant that I was in a holy place and God was there, and if that was true, well, wasn't it possible that every place is holy, including me? Isn't it possible that wherever I go, I encounter God because I bring God with me? How can a God like that be contained in one location? All along, the Israelites had been carrying God around in a tabernacle. To be more specific, they had been carrying around the ark containing the covenant in a tabernacle. Tabernacle means tent or dwelling. And it was the sacred place where God chose to meet the Israelites during the 40 years that they wandered in the desert under Moses' leadership. The tabernacle was God's dwelling among the people on the move. And now that David has come home to roost, he wants to honor God by building something a little more appropriate. But instead, God encourages David to sit back, relax, and enjoy the miracle of what they have accomplished together and trust that at the right time, David's kin will do the job. David is free to treasure his time, perhaps learn how to play golf or catch up on some reading. Basically, David is being confronted with the reality that he will be long dead before this vision is fulfilled. We've heard this before, haven't we? Abraham and Sarah are told that their family will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. But Sarah dies, 
with having only given birth to one child, never to experience the joys of a large extended family. Moses was called to lead the people through the wilderness and into the promised land, but he never got to make it in. After 40 years of leading and preparing the people, Moses only catches a glimpse of the promised land from a mountaintop right before he dies. Both Sarah and Moses played important roles in starting something big, but they never got to experience it themselves. Same with David. He wanted so much to be the one to build a temple for the Lord. Instead, he had to rest on the assurance that one of his children would do it one day. That's a mighty tough pill to swallow. One that sticks right where it hurts the most in our sense of mortality. We cling to the notion of seeing things through, but in matters of faith, things just don't always work that way. Sometimes we only get to play a part, and we have to trust that God will finish the rest. Sometimes we never get to see or even be aware of the differences that we've made in the lives of others. But when God says no to our dreams and desires, it may very well be because God has a faithful and enduring yes for us that moves beyond us to bless others and even future generations. David misunderstood that honoring and praising God wasn't so much about building a building, but building a life through which God could live and move. So God reminded him, by promising to make a house for him in the form of a dynasty rather than a house of cedar. A house that would shelter the hopes and the dreams of a better world. God said no to David's plan to build a temple, but no was not God's final word to David. God sent the prophet Nathan back to David with a hopeful word of promise and new possibilities. God wanted David to know what role he and his descendants would play in God's future plans. And sure enough, just as we heard, a tiny bud appears in Luke's gospel when we heard an angel tell Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Jesus is God's faithfulness to David to all of humanity and to all of creation. John 1.14 tells us the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And here's where things really start to get interesting for a geek like me because the word dwelling is the same word used for tabernacle in the Old Testament. God came in living flesh to dwell or to tabernacle among his people. He walked upon the earth and lived among the Jews. Jesus Christ himself fulfilled the picture of the Old Testament tabernacle. And it gets even better because through Jesus, now we are that house God covenanted with David about. God tells David that, through, that though David's son will build a temple, the house God will build is one that can shelter the dreams and the hopes for a kingdom of God that is within each one of us. And in Ephesians, we're told, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him... The whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. How cool, huh? So what does that mean for us today? It means that not only are we called to be part of a household which embodies reconciliation and peace, we are, each of us, that dwelling place. We're called to be people on the move, reaching beyond any temple or church that we might try to build. It means that while this is indeed a beautiful
beautiful sanctuary and a sacred space. It's not where God lives and where all of our ministry takes place. It's merely where our ministry begins because the household of God stretches beyond these walls out into the city, into the country, into the world. It stretches into a whole landscape of wild and free holiness and beyond that to stars too numerous to count. And as we continue asking ourselves where it is that God is calling us as a church, let us turn to the hard work of recognizing God within the hearts of our fellow human beings, particularly in these last days leading up to the election. This hard work includes listening and reaching out, even if that makes you uncomfortable. But if we are to truly praise God, we must recognize God dwelling in each other. God is a rich, deep, unfathomable mystery. But even when we feel as though we know absolutely nothing about God, there's always one thing that we really, truly do know for sure. And that is that God is love and that God bids us to love one another. Amen. <laughs>